All right, so now that we've talked here about edge blending and how edge blending works, the next thing that we want to take a look at um, is how working with geometry in something like Touch Designer or D3 actually works. Um, and this is a little bit different from the kind of conventional methods on conventional being <laughs> you know, a loose term, I suppose. Um, the methodologies that we typically use when we think about projection mapping these days. This particular approach relies more on three-dimensional modeling than it does on anything else. Uh, so I've already got a complex network set up here, and I'm going to do my best to duplicate the same network and talk my way through it just the way I did um, the last time. So the very first thing that I'm going to need, uh, one of the first ways we need to start thinking about how we work in Touch Designer when we're um, dealing with complex geometry, um, or at least computer model geometry, is the actual model itself. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this model and paste it in here. Oops. And I'm going to clear out all the parameters. I'm going to reset the parameters of this. Uh, so what I did is in Maya, um, I actually, we'll dive in here and take a look, I created just a simple mesh. Uh, that's a half dome, or a half sphere, to represent a dome. And here in Touch Designer, what I've done is I've just gone ahead um, and pulled this in as an FBX file. So I have a piece of geometry that I can use uh, as a reference tool um, for doing a little bit of modeling. Um, and what I want to do here... Uh, in working with this is just talk through what's actually uh, going on when we uh, work with geometry. So I can do that. Let's uh, go ahead and take this. We're going to cut it out of here. We're going to create a new component, or a new container, so we can uh, create this network without some of the visual distractions we were seeing in the other place. So one of the things to think about in Touch Designer is that when I'm dealing with a piece of geometry like this, or when I'm wanting to render something, rather, when I want to send something to a projector, especially something that's a 3D model like this, I can't just output the geometry. Um, the rules of Touch Designer mean that if I want to convert uh, one of these pieces of geometry, one of these surface operators, essentially, into a texture operator, is I need to use this render um, command. And the render command uh, in Touch Designer uh, requires a few component elements to be able to make the render work. In order to be able to draw this piece of geometry, what I need is I need the reference geometry, so I need the actual structure itself. I also need a light, so I need some way to illuminate this particular scene that I've created. And I also need a camera. I need a perspective that I am viewing this particular piece of geometry from. Now, what I've got set up here right now is just the dome. And look that we can see that we're just looking straight at the horizon of the dome, or right at the edge of it rather. Uh, and this is kind of boring. So, if I wanted to, for example, uh, color this dome with a different, um, either with a different color or with any kind of video. What I need to do is I need to use a material, and in this case I'm going to use a Fong shader uh, as my material. So once I've inserted my material here, I can drag that right on top of my geometry. I get that little plus symbol, and when I release it, I can apply the parameter of this material to my geometry. Now the next thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to back out of this container here, because what I want to do is I'm going to come up here and grab my um, texture that I was dealing with earlier and borrow that for this particular demonstration. So now I've got this texture, and this texture could be anything. This could be a pre-built asset. This could be um, video that's running in from another system. So for example, I might have Isadora running on another computer, passing out an HD signal that's then being sent into this machine. I might be um, capturing a live uh, video camera. This can be anything, really. 
anything pre-built or live. So now I'm going to take my um, input, my video or my, mo my movie in, and apply that to my Fong shader as a, com as a color map. So now essentially what I've done is I've taken this image and I've passed it through this Fong shader so that I can paint the interior surface of my dome, really the whole surface of my dome, with this image uh, as a color. So that's one of the ways that I can get uh, imagery onto three-dimensional structures here inside of Touch Designer. Now we can see that when I manipulate this piece of geometry, um, what happens is that my render doesn't actually change. And my render doesn't change because what the render is relying upon in order to draw uh, this particular scene is it's relying on the perspective of the camera. So if we're in a situation, for example, like we definitely will be when, um, with this dome construction, where we have multiple projectors that we need to use to illuminate the full structure of the dome, we have to think about how we're breaking up this um, piece of imagery and spitting that out to different projectors. And in how we do that with touch designers, we really think of the cameras uh, as analogous to projectors. So in order to get a better look at this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create another camera. I'm going to create another render also. And this render now uh, is, I'm going to be able to use this render as my, um, as having the perspective of my second projector. Now we can see that these exported parameters, these dotted lines represent exported parameters. Currently, um, what we're seeing is that this particular render is receiving all of the exported parameters from all of my um, operators up here above. And while I want the light and the geometry to show up, I don't want my camera to show up. So by selecting my render, if I look at my parameters tab, I can specify that I want this to rely on the perspective of camera 2 and not camera 1. So here in my parameters, what I'm seeing is that this is relying on uh, the name of the camera operator, the name of the geo. So geo star means that it's accepting all geometries. And because I've got just a star in here for lights, it's accepting all lights. So I don't necessarily, um, I'm not really that interested right now about worrying about uh, geometry or lights in this particular example, but if I wanted to isolate a piece of the dome, um, I could s cut that up either in Maya or here in Touch Designer so that I was painting only a specific region of the dome with a particular piece of uh, media content. So the next thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to uh, want to think about how these pieces of rendered material are actually showing up. So if I zoom in here to the renders, this is not actually doing what I want it to do. So while I'm seeing the edge of the dome, I'm seeing the edge of the dome from the same location of both cameras. Um, and in this particular setup, it means that I've got the same image coming out of both projectors, because I'm really thinking of this as projector one and projector two. I'm going to go ahead and rename those. So we have a, so that's at least projector two, a convention that we can see out the gate. So the way that I can really start to think about how I'm manipulating the location of my cameras is I'm going to go ahead and open up my geometry viewer. So here in Touch Designer, one of the things I can do is I can split up my display so I can look at multiple pieces of my network at the same time. So I'm going to turn off my parameter tab here. Um, I just use a quick hotkey P to turn off the parameter view. Um, and from here, so I can dive into different components. Um, or zoom out of components or operators. I can also, um, so that allows me to see kind of two different tiers of activity in the same network. I can also use my drop down menu here to, instead of looking at my network editor where I am right now, to look at my geometry viewer. So in looking at my geometry viewer, this actually gives me a totally different perspective on what I'm creating. Now I can see I've got this funny little shape over here, and I've got some funny little shape over here. 
Um, and this is actually my light, and these are my cameras. So I'm going to go ahead and make a couple changes on the parameters of these particular um, components so that we can see them a little better. For one thing, I want to place the light at the origin. So now my light's located at the origin, and I'm going to change the scale of this to be larger so I can actually see this light as an object. Um, because when they're at the smaller scale, it can be really difficult to see them uh, very clearly. Similarly, I'm going to go ahead and highlight my camera, and I'm going to change the scale of my cameras also. I'm going to make those 5, 5, 5. Go. Let's make this one 5, 5, 5 also. So this way, this method of visualizing these uh, components doesn't change any of the output. It just makes it easier for me to see the location of these particular objects. So now I can see that I've got my light here at the center and I've got my uh, camera here at this position um, translated down the x-axis at 5. And I can see that that's, that's not really doing me any good because in all reality the location of the projector is likely to be further back. It's likely to be um, close to the edge of the dome for one. And the image that I'm shooting on the projector it doesn't want to have all of this a blank space underneath it. I really want to be able to think about projecting or pointing my projector to be um, a little more upright and hitting or casting um, more of the vertical surface here. So I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to rotate or I'm going to translate this um, down slightly. So we want to go down a little bit and then I'm going to rotate it. So that is actually looking oops, up a little bit more. So I'm actually going to rotate this so it's looking up. And if I look here at my projector, I can actually see what's going on uh, with respect of how much of this is actually coming out of the render. Uh, and how close I am to the edge of this particular surface. So then I can do a little bit of fine tuning here to make sure that I am taking advantage of as much of my raster as possible. So now I've got one camera, or one projector focused, and I've still got this other camera at this other funky location. Um, and to fix that, I'm going to just find my other camera, and I'm going to start working the same way. So I'm going to highlight this puppy, I know that I probably want a similar uh, location in terms of its translation back, but I probably want it uh, translated back along the x-axis instead of along the z-axis. So I'm going to go ahead and make this 0, not 50. Well, while it's at the origin here, I'm going to go ahead and do just a little bit of rotating. So I'm going to turn it so it's pointed towards the origin. And now I'm going to do uh, the same amount of translation, negative uh, 10. to take it back along the x-axis, oops, not the y-axis, negative 10, positive 10 is what I meant to say. All right, so now I also want to move it down, like I did the other one, down 4, and I'm similarly going to want to rotate it um, up slightly. Because if I come up here and I turn on the render there, I can see that I'm just seeing a small portion of this. So I'm going to come in here. I can actually use this other camera uh, as a reference. So 24 is the amount of rotation that I had in there. And there we go. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn off this render. And in my geometry viewer, I can start to get a, a sense of the location of my projector, so where are my projectors located in relationship to the structure, and what portion of the dome are those responsible for. So I can also here in my camera's um, parameters, I can apply um, the same uh, uh, characteristics that are relative to my projector. Um, 
So I can, for example, the projection type can be perspective or orthographic. Um, I can look at the field of view. I can control the angle of the field of, uh, angle of the field of view, um, as well as a couple of, of the other parameters to make sure that my camera is an analog for uh, the projector that I'm going to be using. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and just close my geometry viewer there. Excuse me. And so now we can see um, if I turn on the render flag for both of these or the display flag. So now I've got this uh, image out of both of these pieces. Now, invariably, what I'm going to want to have to what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to do some edge blending with my pieces of geometry. And I'm likely going to want to be able to create some masking as well. Because all of this stuff here on the bottom is something that I'm going to want to have masked out to black, like likely. Um, and I can start to think about how that's going to work by adding in a composite. And both of these are going to be composite, of course. You can also, you can resize these nodes to be same sizes just by selecting them and clicking them uh, just a single time. And of course, the neatness of your network is up to you. I like to have a tidy network. So I know in this particular composite, because I'm dealing with just masking, um, and I'm going to go ahead and even just label this mask at the bottom. What I want to do here is I want to deal with uh, a constant. And a constant is um, a solid, essentially. So my constant here, uh, I want to make it black. I'm going to come in here and change the parameter. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop that into the composite. I'm going to switch the orientation of those. Right, and I've got the same problem I had before. So instead of additive, I have multiply, so I'm just going to go ahead and switch this to be additive, additive, and so now I can see, I can turn on my uh, render flag here, I just click flag, I've added a black mask, I've essentially just made the background of this black. Now if I didn't want to use that particular method, so if I wanted, um, this is really a handy way to think about masking. Um, so that if I have other pieces of background elements in my geometry, um, I can control that a little bit. Another way to, to do that um, would be to come in here and in the background tab, um, say that I want, I could select a color for the background. So if I bypass my um, constant here, we come into the camera and I could make this uh, zero, 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 and 100% alpha. Um, and so now I've got a black background. So that's another way to solve that same problem. Like many uh, nodal programming environments, there are multiple ways to solve the same problem, of course. All right, so now uh, what I've done is I've got uh, a single video input. I'm using that as a material to shade a piece of geometry um, that's analogous to my actual set. I'm painting that, or I'm um, controlling how that's being displayed based on the location of two separate cameras, which are, really represent two separate projectors, a light, and I'm sending that through um, a render top, and then I'm compositing that with some um, black, so that I've got a mask. So that's what's going on here. And that's really uh, the kind of nuts and bolts way in Touch Designer, um, and similarly in D3, of how we think about dealing with three-dimensional pieces of our three-dimensional sync elements and how these um, programming environments really think about projection method. You know, I could, of course, do it um, 
you know, kind of the old fashioned way and create assets that were warped to the surface that I was dealing with. But this is really allowing, especially this material, is allowing me to do a lot of that um, warping and uh, changing within the actual, um, or I'm letting Touch Designer do that live rather than worrying about how to do that myself. 